than what we've heard previously. We've heard from a number of the earlier lecturers uh, what I think is some beautiful theory that has a lot of generality. My lectures, I decided to sort of focus on some concrete questions, as concrete as I could make them, focusing on specific systems and really emphasizing what can you calculate? What does it take to calculate some interesting physical quantities which teach you something about thermalization starting from first principles in some microscopic theory of interest or at least some microscopic theory that I find interesting. Now the organizers encouraged me to give a blackboard talk so that's what I'm going to do. I warn you my handwriting is not always the best so particularly for those in the back of the room um, Either feel free to speak up when I write so poorly that you can't read it, or, or move to some of these nice empty chairs in front. OK, so so I want to talk about calculating non-equilibrium response in several different settings from first principles. And I want to talk about, well, at least with some definition, real systems. And one of my definitions of real systems is that h bar does not equal 0. So right, real atoms, real molecules, if you want to talk about how they behave, if you want to talk about their collisions, which are ultimately part of what's responsible for all long time behavior, that's quantum dynamics. If you want to think about uh, many other systems, whether it's solid state systems, um, whether it's early universe dynamics, <coughs> basically it's all going to be quantum dynamics at some level. Yes. I mean, my definition of my underlying theory is going to be a quantum theory. And in particular, it's going to be a quantum field theory. As a microscopic theory as opposed to an theory? The starting point will be a microscopic theory, but a much of the discussion will be how to connect it with a sequence of useful effective theories. So I will say more about that momentarily. All right. Um, the sort of systems I want you to think about are systems which, on su sufficiently long length scales, you can regard as a fluid. So you're free to think about that as ordinary water. You're free to think about that as air. But I encourage you to think about it much more generally. You could be interested in um, quantum Hall fluids the behavior of droplets of electrons that form effectively two-dimensional fluids in quantum Hall systems. You could be interested in the plasma in the center of the sun. You could be interested in a variety of other astrophysical plasmas. I mean, there's lots of fluids. They doesn't have to be things that are easy to recreate in a lab. But what is relevant for me is I'm not going to worry about any problem where I have to think about finite size effects my volume is always going to be infinity or effectively I'm taking a thermodynamic limit that also means that I will never talk about a heat bath the system is the heat bath okay and I will I will use my theorist prerogative to choose a particular system that describes a fluid that happens 
both to be interesting and to be, in some limited sense, tractable. So by that standard, actually talking about water is too hard for me. Anything that involves actual molecules, molecular collisions are complicated. You have all these vibrational degrees of freedom, rotational degrees of freedom, some first principle description. You have to know everything there is to know about how molecules or atoms scatter. That's hard. So I'm going to choose to look at systems where I actually do have complete understanding of scattering processes at a microscopic level. And so, so I'll just choose to look at systems that don't involve real atoms and molecules. Um, now, I want to emphasize Think about condensed matter physics for a second. There's a huge range of systems. Out of the vast range of systems, though, many systems allow a useful description of the dynamics of those systems. In other words, a useful description of the relevant excitations in terms of what are commonly called quasi-particles. And I'm hoping that most of you have heard at least various examples of this, because there's many. We could be talking about phonons in a crystal. We could be talking about phonons and rotons in something like liquid helium. We could be talking about dressed electrons and holes in a semiconductor. We could be talking about spin waves, or if you want to use quantum language, magnons in some spin system. We could be talking about plasmons. These are all examples of fine quasi-particles. If you happen to like thinking about particle physics, you're equally free to think about W and Z bosons, mu leptons, the recently discovered Higgs particle. All of these are also, properly speaking, quasi-particles. Yes. But it's more than just that. So by calling something a quasi-particle, what you really mean is you're saying it's some sort of excitation. It is typically unstable, but nevertheless, it is long-lived and weakly interacting. So it acts like a particle. It can move from here to there. It carries energy. It carries momentum. But it may not live forever. It can scatter. But in some appropriate sense, it's weakly interacting. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean to be long-lived? It's got to be long-lived compared to something. So it'll have some lifetime. And the appropriate thing to compare it to is well, going back to basic quantum mechanics, the time scale associated with its energy. Yes, sir, may I ask one question? This quasi particle is direction, eh? They can generate harder particles, harder quasi particles. They can generate the harder quasi particle in the condensed matter to be the quantum view or to be as the elementary expectations are the quasi particle. Mm -hmm. And this quasi particles are the long lived. Yes. Let, let me come back to that. Okay. Do you need to meet the interaction for uh, treatment, or is that something fundamental? Because I guess if you write on W and Z, you mean this will be this will be very clear. I mean, the short answer is yes, but this will be very clear for what I want to talk about in just a minute. So clearly, there are cases where this will not be true. 
and then a different discussion is appropriate. And, well, let me preview. Today, I want to focus on systems where this is true. You do have a good quasi-particle description. Tomorrow, I want to focus on certain instructive systems where you do not. OK, but the nicer systems, in some sense, are systems where you do have a quasi-particle description. All right, saying that it's long-lived is a condition like that. I can turn it around, exactly the same information content, just with different words, is to say, look at the decay rate, or the inverse lifetime, by calling it a good quasi-particle, you're saying that that decay rate is small compared to the energy. Um, in the words that I just used, you can already tell that I'm not very good about keeping h-bars in the right place. So is it a rate or is it an energy? Well, there's really a factor of h-bar that converts them. So I will pretty much stop writing h-bar momentarily. And for most of my talk, I will use systems of units where I can set h-bar and the speed of light and Boltzmann's constant equal to 1. So that means temperatures are the same as energies. You might as well always think about them that way. It means energies are the same as frequencies, are the same as momenta, are the same as mass. Yes? Uh, you said that uh, we don't want to need that, right? So do we ever need AB, both of us? We will. I'll just leave it at that. OK. These conditions ought to look very familiar to you. Go back to elementary physics, go back to masses on springs or lots of other systems where you measure some sort of response as a function of some sort of driving frequency or energy. And in a vast array of systems, you see a peak, which is a resonance. And by saying it's a long-lived resonance, you're saying precisely the same thing I said here, that the width of the resonance is small compared to its characteristic energy. Okay, so quasi-particles are really just another name for saying you have excitations which act like long-lived resonances. Saying it's weakly interacting is saying something about how it scatters. You can talk about a mean free path, typical distance some excitation travels before it scatters off some other excitation. By saying it's weakly interacting, you're saying that distance is large compared to something, and the natural thing to compare it to is the de Broglie wavelength. All right, so in symbols, L mean free path large compared to h bar over momentum. If instead you want to talk about a mean free time, the time between scatterings, that's the analogous condition. OK, so Think about distance scales for a second. Suppose I've got some system where I can think of it as a whole bunch of excitations running around. Those excitations have some characteristic wavelength. And that will typically be the shortest relevant length scale 
that's important in the problem. By saying that you have good quasi-particles, you're saying there's some other length scale, the mean free path, that's much longer. If this giant collection of lots and lots of excitations is ultimately acting like a fluid, you're saying that on some sort of distance scales out here, we should be able to describe it using hydrodynamics. We should be able to write down hydrodynamic equations. It will involve parameters like viscosity that ultimately reflect the microscopic properties of the system. And the challenge I basically want to talk about is how to go from some microscopic theory to an evaluation of the parameters, the transport coefficients, like viscosity, that appear in that hydrodynamic description. How does the hydrodynamic scale affect the mean Well, so when is hydrodynamics valid? The part of the condition is simply that you better be looking at distance scales large compared to a typical mean free path. You're describing the system, you're describing the system in terms of average quantities that involve a notion of some local, some fluid cell with some well-defined local fluid velocity. You're certainly not tracking individual excitations and saying, how did they scatter? So any discussion of hydrodynamics, I better be talking about distance scales that are large compared to the relevant mean free path. In systems with a good quasi-particle description, I'll get back in just a second, what I try to emphasize is I have a large separation between these scales. So I have some microscopic theory, which is valid on all distance scales, but it doesn't mean it's convenient to use. It doesn't mean it's easy to calculate. By having this separation, the point is it's useful to talk about an intermediate effective theory. And that intermediate effective theory is precisely kinetic theory. And in order to go from microscopic theory to properties of hydrodynamics, it may well be, and I want to argue it is, vastly more convenient to do it in two steps first go from a microscopic theory to build a correct kinetic theory with very specific properties characterizing how these quasi-particles interact and scatter, and then use that kinetic theory to derive the appropriate hydrodynamic parameters. Question? Sir, suppose I consider a quantum many-body system, yeah. strongly correlated system. OK. So the strongly correlated system is strong to in direction. OK. And in your hydrodynamic Yes. But I want to emphasize today for this lecture, I'm focusing on systems which do have good quasi particle descriptions. And so when you say let's consider some strongly correlated system. That's exactly the sort of system I don't want to talk about today. Will the kinetic theory be semi-classical or, or it will still retain quantum? Uh, from there onwards, retain still quantum? Okay. Um, it sort of depends what you mean by retain. I think it will be obvious in a second. It has quantum input yeah. because it has sure. scattering rates. Yeah. But other than but that, other than that by saying that this is true, um, well, right here. So I'm going to be, I have to do a good job tracking what my excitations are doing over t distances that are very large compared to the de Broglie wavelengths. I want to argue that when those conditions are satisfied, an appropriate effective theory is basically just classical kinetic theory, provided you adjust the collision terms to represent the correct physics. OK, um, even though I've already said it, I want to write it up here because it's important. <coughs> 
good quasi-particle description implies this large separation of scales. And I'm arguing implies that the appropriate effective theory is kinetic theory. there not to use the edge. <laughs> so kinetic theory I know was briefly mentioned earlier, but nobody has spent much time talking about it. So let me give sort of a quick run through, which I hope has kind of a familiar ring, but it will be useful to get a number of things up on the board, as well as just show my notation. All right, so kinetic theory is all built around the notion of saying, I want to track the distribution and phase space of whatever the relevant excitations are. So I'm not trying to track excitations individually, but I imagine little cells in phase space. I count how many excitations are in each cell. I build the distribution, and we want to understand its time dependence. This is a single particle phase space, or this is the phase space for the whole system? This is a phase space of the relevant quasi-particle excitations. Of each one individually? or one? No, no, the collection. Okay. And there may well be quasi-particles of different types. So I may need some species label. So I'll put some extra little label up here. It's the species. That's just a detail. Um, minor point, I'll have four vectors momentarily. I'll have three vectors. So little wiggles underneath is just a reminder it's a three vector. All right. I do want to emphasize at this sort of motivational scale that there are lots of discussions of kinetic theory that frame it in terms of tracking the underlying microscopic particles of a system. That makes sense if I'm talking about a bunch of ball bearings rattling around in a box. But it's really helpful to think about it more generally as kinetic theory is naturally formulated for not whatever the microscopic degrees of freedom of your system are, they're formulated for the quasi-particles, which are the relevant, weakly interacting, long-lived excitations. Uh, just a quick question. Here, XP, is it three vectors or three So, three vectors. So you're only one no, no, no. This is a phase space distribution. So the value of this function at some point in phase space is telling me the density of excitations at that point in phase space. Of the single particle phase space. It's a function yes. on the single particle phase space, not yes. the phase space for the whole system. The, the whole Absolutely. System. Okay, good. The only systems I'm talking about, the what you just thought of as the full phase space is some infinite dimensional manifold. I do not want to think about that. You do not want to think about that. Just only you were thinking about the quasi-particle. Correct. OK, so given a phase space distribution, you can now calculate things which may be of interest if we're talking about fluids and hydrodynamics, ultimately that means talking about energy density or momentum density or stress is relevant. I might as well package them together and just say that's talking about the stress energy tensor. I'll write it that way. I will write a little bit shorthand here. 
multiple species I sum over it. And in writing this, <coughs> first of all, I've switched to introducing four vectors for space-time positions. That just means there's less to write. I'm also introducing four vectors for space-time momenta. So I simply glue some time component onto the spatial momentum where that time component up to a factor of c, which is set to 1, <laughs> is simply the energy of your quasi-particle. So by saying you have a quasi-particle description, you have to have an answer to the question, what is the energy of a quasi-particle that's carrying a given amount of momentum? So I'm going to have lots of formulas that involve four vectors. In those four <laughs> vectors, there's a time component. But that time component just is fixed by your knowledge of what is the dispersion relation of your quasi-particles. Which we're not taking to be relativistic. Which may or may not be relativistic. We'll typically have corrections due to the basically medium properties. And beyond that, I just introduced a little shorthand notation integrating over P really means integrating over all spatial momentum but with the factor of 1 over the energy thrown in and that's convenient because in cases where it is relativistic and this is there's a relativistic relation between energy and momentum this is a Lorentz invariant measure on momentum. So, so far this is not one. You haven't said anything. Correct. Correct. Okay, and let me just mention, you know, if you look at this, if you haven't seen this before, it may look a little peculiar. So for example, the T00 is energy density. So now you see if I set both mu and nu equal to 0, two factors of p0, what's that doing there? Well, one of them just got canceled by the, is hidden in the measure. So in the end, this is nothing but simply saying integrate d3p of your distribution function weighted by one factor of the energy of the quasi-particle. <coughs> That's exactly what should look appropriate. That's what is appropriate for the energy density evaluated at some point in space time. This is a three dimensional integral. It's not a four dimensional integral. But if you want, well, okay. You could equally well write this as d4p multiplied by a delta function setting um, I didn't want to write this because this gets into metric conventions. So let me write it as um, I'm not going to write for so Lorentz invariant theories, you can write that nicely in terms of a delta function that puts the particle on shell. And if that makes sense, that's fine. And if it doesn't, that's fine. Delta function in terms of delta omega squared minus That's right. But however you do it, you can easily show that this is a Lorentz invariant measure. OK. Um, we'll often be interested not only in a energy momentum or stress energy tensor, but also in a current, which you could think of as an electromagnetic current, <coughs> whose time component gives you the charge density and spatial components gives you the electromagnetic sort of ordinary current density. You're free to think of this as a current <coughs> 
in other cases, which is really a mass current, whose time component gives you the mass density and whose spatial components give you the flux of mass. All right. In either case, what is it? Well, it's simply counting up all of your quasi-particles, weighting them by how much of this current do they carry. All right. So that's a single p mu. That's sum over all species. Your distribution function, but typically weighted by some factor that could depend on the species, which is how much charge or mass or whatever this current refers to is carried by a particular species of quasi-particle. OK, and then the dynamics is the Boltzmann equation. Which I can write as a term like this. Maybe you'll have some external force you want to turn on. That may or may not be there. In any case, this linear differential operator acts on the distribution function and equals some ugly right-hand side, which I will just write schematically as a collision term. And hiding here, these first two terms form what's often called a convective derivative. You need to know what the velocity of your excitation is. But if you know the dispersion relation, then you know the velocity. More precisely, group velocity. And just so I can, don't have to write it out again later, <laughs> let me just give a name to that differential operator for no particularly good reason. I'll call it script K. It typically will. And so let me write that. I'm assuming that I have a description of the system that is accurate in its appropriate domain of validity that only involves the single particle distribution function. Right? So this is, like any effective theory, an approximation. There will ultimately be corrections, but the key point is that those corrections all involve ratios of what define your separation of scale. So I already assumed I have that large scale separation, so I'm saying I'm happy to neglect relative corrections suppressed by powers of that scale, that ratio of scales. What? Oh, that's right, coming right next. Okay, so the collision term. All right, there's nothing. Nothing special that I'm writing that's very different than what Boltzmann wrote however many years ago. So a collision term is simply an accounting for what's the rate at which excitations either enter or leave the particular phase space element that you're focusing your attention on. So if I have some sort of two particle scattering processes that are relevant. Right? I could have some excitation with momentum P coming in, scatters off some excitation with momentum K, turns into some excitations with momentum P prime and K prime. That would be a case where a scattering process removes an excitation from my phase space element with momentum P. Of course, I can draw exactly the same picture, but where momentum P is the momentum of an outgoing particle, 
and uh, P prime and K prime are the incoming <coughs> momentum. Yes? Um, that's an excellent question, which I just prefer to come back to in a little bit. Does the Boltzmann equation describe decay of particles? Yes. Okay, but I'll say talk about it right now. In effect, yes. Right? You're not putting decay of excitation somehow hiding in the left hand side, but decay of particles decay in this sense, think of it as saying you have some complicated system, you looked at it at some instant in time and you noticed there was an excitation of some sharply defined momentum T. And now you just wait. Saying that excitation decayed, that word sort of carries connotations which may be misleading. It's simply that you look at the system at some later time and you failed to find that same excitation with momentum P. Well, that's what happens when it scatters. Right? The scattering processes are the same processes which are giving you the actual width in that resonance that underlies your picture of a quasi-particle. OK, let me just get this up here. I want to integrate. So I'm looking at scattering processes where the incoming or outgoing momenta of one of the excitations is my choice and is fixed, but all the others I integrate over there is some transition rate, which quantum mechanically is the square of some transition amplitude. So that's the way I'll write it. There's some transition amplitude depending on the momenta of the incoming and outgoing particles. Take its absolute square. Demand that energy and momentum conservation be satisfied, which I'll write together with a single four-dimensional delta function and then account for the fact of how often does the scattering go one way and how often does the scattering go the other way and that depends on the phase space distribution of particles and so this is where you get And here, I have gotten sloppier with my notation. F sub p just means the distribution function evaluated from momentum p. And everything is evaluated at just some single space-time location. So the whole collision term is local in space-time. That's important. Well, so we're talking about underlying quantum dynamics. And that means your excitations are either going to be, well, ignoring certain two-dimensional cases of anions. Your excitations will either be bosons or fermions. So the plus or minus is just to distinguish, do you have Bose statistics or do you have Fermi statistics? And I'll always put Bose on top of Fermi. <laughs> All right, that's it. If, and it's a big if, I want to emphasize it, this is it. If the only relevant scattering processes are those in which two incoming particles scatter into two outgoing particles, or what I will abbreviate as two to two scattering. is the only relevant process. Sorry. Is it, is it trivial that it has to be local in space all the time? Well, again, I go back to my separation of scale. So ultimately, that's certainly not true. I mean, real scattering events 
have some microscopic scale. It actually involves energy or momentum dependence of the relevant scattering amplitudes. All right. But once again, I'm assuming I have a good quasi-particle description with mean free paths and large compared to microscopic scales. I just erased my, my picture of relevant scales, but this kinetic theory is never intended to apply to scales where you would resolve that internal structure. And the quasi-particle identity is retained throughout. Yes, there's no disappearance of the like quasi-particle cannot be these are great questions which actually anticipate some things that are going to come up later. <laughs> Now, so it is true that by saying you have a good quasi-particle description, it had better be the case that you can understand conservation of energy and momentum in terms of your quasi-particles. So it can't be the case that, if, that in this description, a quasi-particle just disappears, poof, because then you just destroyed energy. So in other words, you have to be describing the process that's actually causing it to do something. And one way or another, that has to go into correctly constructing a collision term, which may well be a little more general than what I have on the board. So, so here, a uh, uh, quasi particle of one species only interacts with the same species. Oh, no, no, no. I just, OK. So I could be dressing everything with species labels. And so it just got erased, which was unfortunate. But the collision term is specific for some species. Well, let me call it species A. The collision process could involve, you know, species A, species B, species C, species D, and I could go dress this up. Um, a, a, B, C, D, and then sums over B, C, and D. Mostly, I'll just drop species labels just because you. Once you understand that, you always can figure out what that Once you write this, this would kind of uh, tell you that uh, species can get converted from one to the other. Absolutely. So let me just do it more carefully once. So again, and here you already made the assumption of independence of the ongoing particles, and you will keep it. Yes which is already implicit in the short, uh, in the long. It's implicit in saying I'm, I'm using that scale separation, and that, that is characterizing the size of effects I'm willing to neglect. But more formally, that was implicit in saying, let's formulate the best effective theory we can that only involves the one particle phase phase distribution. OK, that's a Boltzmann equation in some moderately general form. It's easy to say, what are its solutions in equilibrium? Where nothing, there's no spatial or temporal variation. And an equilibrium distribution, well, doesn't depend on space or time, it just depends on momentum. I'll write it as F sub zero, just for convenience. And I want to be slightly general in how I write this. And now I'm not really worrying about species labels. And just to keep it simple, uh, all right, and here we have nothing but a equilibrium Bose or Fermi distribution function where beta is 1 over the temperature. I admire those of you who can keep writing Boltzmann constants everywhere throughout your lecture. I cannot do it. I have chosen 
to write this equilibrium distribution, though, in a form in which the average momentum of the excitations need not be zero. That's just reflecting your freedom to look at a system in any coordinate frame you want. I can look at it in a boosted frame. And so I have some four velocity I'm calling u, which is characterizing the um, rest frame of an equilibrium ensemble. I may well have a chemical potential, and there it is. So except perhaps for allowing an arbitrary 4 velocity, this should look familiar. If we were looking at it in the rest frame, this 4 velocity would have a time component and nothing else. So this would just reduce to the usual um, e to the minus uh, beta times the energy. Oh, I was trying not to do this, but I just wrote a dot product which reveals my metric convention. So, okay, I'll write it. The only, the only sensible metric convention to use. Okay, so the Boltzmann equation, which is no longer up here. <laughs> it's the right convention. <laughs> so the Boltzmann equation has a left-hand side, which is the convective derivative stuff, and a right-hand side. And this distribution has no dependence on space or time. So trivially, the left-hand side vanishes if there's no external force. A short exercise shows you that even when you know nothing about, or almost nothing, about these transition amplitudes, the right-hand side also vanishes for a distribution of function of this form. Well, the one thing I have to know is that these transition amplitudes satisfy detailed balance. Or if you like to be a little more formal, that I'm looking at a sensible theory, and all sensible theories are CPT invariant. Oh, good. So given specification of the momentum of one initial particle, well, obviously, the particle it scatters off of can have any momentum. So that's one of the things I'm integrating over. No. Given, given <laughs> specifications of the momentum of the two particles coming in, the momentum of the two excitations coming out are not fully determined. That's just saying you can have, for the same initial incoming particles, you can have scattering events which have different scattering angles. Or if you want to think about it classically, it comes from having different impact parameters. But when the dust settles, that says the momenta that comes out, well, there's one independent momenta, but not two. I wrote it as if there's two independent momenta, but there's a delta function which you could use to eliminate any one of the external four momenta. Uh, what is LHS equal to zero? So this saying the left-hand side, so take this distribution function, plug it into the Boltzmann equation. I just can't read what you have written If the external force, EXT. Right, so the left-hand side had time and space derivative terms, and it had a term that involved an external force dotted into a momentum derivative. Right, if that term vanishes, then it's immediate. The left-hand side of the Boltzmann equation equals zero, as long as we have a theory whose scattering rates satisfy detailed balance. The short exercise, so the right-hand side equals zero. So this is a nice equilibrium distribution. Okay, for this meeting, my appropriate perspective is equilibrium is boring. Stuff just sits there, nothing happens, boring. <laughs>
So what we want to do is understand departures from equilibrium and much physics, not all, but much physics can be understood by examining small departures from equilibrium. <coughs> right? So it's completely standard to say, let's look at a situation where the distribution function differs from equilibrium by some amount that I can regard as small. And let's linearize the Boltzmann equation in that departure from equilibrium. Are you saying that RHS is zero independently of the, uh, just by looking at the terms here of C of F, or are you saying that it's RHS is zero because NHS has to be zero? Is that what you're saying, or are you plugging in the F naught of P into this? So I'm saying plug for any choice of these parameters, but notice these parameters. There's no space dependence here. You get to choose the temperature, the flow velocity, the chemical potential once, but it's the same everywhere. Um, you know, take this form of the distribution function, which completely specifies its dependence on momentum, stuff it in over here. I haven't told you anything about these scattering amplitudes. They could be horribly complicated. Nevertheless, I claim the result is zero. And to see that, well, you have to know the little bit which says the rate for reactions going forward is related to the rate for reactions going backwards. So ultimately, for an equilibrium distribution function, the part of the integral that you get from these terms exactly cancels the part from that term. And it's a, it's a short exercise. Question? Where, mm -hmm. where you go beyond the I was then wondering that if you have a system with uh, a gauge symmetry, and uh, I was worried, OK, you could gauge fix, but then there might be constraints on the thing. So then Br bring that up in a little bit, because I'm okay. going to be talking about gauge theories, okay. even though I'm not going to talk about gauge fixing. But this collision term would be very easy to incorporate the decay by having a one to two particle scattering, right? Or, or is it so easy? Like I emphasized to Vogel, you've got to be correctly representing where energy and momentum is going, as well as any other conserved quantities. But but there is a core of truth to what you're saying, which is going to come up, assuming we don't run out of time. OK, linearize. Take the distribution, write it as an equilibrium distribution, except now I do want to do something which is a little, perhaps a little strange. I want to give it some x dependence by saying I use this equilibrium distribution function, but I suddenly allow beta to depend on space time. I allow the four velocity to depend on space time. I allow the chemical potential to depend on space time. But all this dependence on space time, I'm going to assume is slow. So there are non-vanishing derivatives with respect to space-time coordinates, but that in some appropriate sense, those derivatives are small. But as long as those derivatives are non-zero, this will no longer satisfy the Boltzmann equation. So add a correction, which will represent what you have to add to fix it up. And it just happens to be convenient to write that correction in this form where I just factored out a factor of the equilibrium distribution times 1 plus or minus itself. That just makes later results convenient. I introduce some function I'm calling capital phi, which is describing the departure from equilibrium, or more precisely, from local. Local equilibrium. Local equilibrium is just a buzzword saying that the distribution function looks just like this at any particular value of x, but that these parameters can vary from point to point in space time. And phi does not depend on time? Yes. So x here, Sorry. everywhere, um, is a space time vector, just so I don't have to write so many arguments. So Maybe this doesn't make much sense, but uh, this reference velocity of your referential 
include it as a freedom. When you do the departures in two different places, the, the referential will have the same speed in two different places, or it could be locally? No. So you can say, let's choose some velocity field, u, which, which describes some flow you're interested in. <coughs> So that could be describing velocity that's moving this way over there and, and this way over here. And I mean sort of previewing, but it seems natural to do it. If I want to talk about extracting ultimately hydrodynamic transport coefficients, one of the things I want to talk about is shear viscosity. And that's exactly what you have to do. Shear viscosity is telling you about response of the system to a, a shear in this flow field. Okay. And small here means small gradients. Yes. If f zero shouldn't depend on x, or should it? I just made it depend on x, but only through this implicit dependence right. via the parameters which labeled equilibrium states. Okay. So take that, stick it in the Boltzmann equation. And when I say linearize, I mean keep first order terms that are small. Those small first order terms are either terms that involve the gradients of these functions, which I just allowed to be in there, but I said were small, or they involve phi. But terms which involve, say, a gradient of any one of these things times phi are now second order in small quantities, and so those I won't keep. <coughs> okay, so go back to the Boltzmann equation, go to the collision term, which I just erased. Evaluate the right-hand side. Well, that was the collision term acting on the first piece. And I just allowed spatial dependence in this first piece. But remember, the collision term is completely local in space. So this cancellation that makes the collision term vanish in equilibrium also makes it exactly vanish, even if I have time or space dependent parameters. All right, then take that ugly collision term, expand in the second term. What you're going to get is some big mess of stuff multiplied by, well, you're going to get terms which are linear in this departure from equilibrium. I don't want to write them down. I mean, it's straightforward. You can work it out. It's kind of ugly. I just want to give it a name. There's some linear operator. I'll call it script C, acting on phi. Um. Yes. Yes. But I want to emphasize that's not an additional input. It's just I skipped over it. So we had a Boltzmann equation which we said defined the dynamics of the system. I wrote down expressions for stress energy tensor or conserved current in terms of the distribution function. It's now an exercise to check that if you satisfy the Boltzmann equation in the absence of an external force, then you've actually satisfied conservation equations for the stress energy tensor. In other words, you've satisfied local conservation of energy and momentum. That was automatic because in the collision terms, there was that delta function that was just explicitly enforcing energy momentum conservation. There's no way it could not have worked. Okay, so 
We have terms linear in the departure from equilibrium. We have higher order terms, which I'm ignoring. This thing C is a linearized collision operator. All right, the left hand side, that's what involves space time derivatives. Those space time derivatives can act on any one of these parameters, and they're now going to give non zero terms. Those space time derivatives could also act on this term, but that will now give me stuff which will be second order in small quantities. So if I'm linearizing the equation, the only thing I have to keep track of is space-time derivatives acting on the first term. And so that will give me what I call, for shorthand, my differential operator k acting on f0 plus higher order stuff, which I ignore. And this, I just want to emphasize, right, involves stuff which is gradients of inverse temperature, chemical potential, or flow velocity, or I'll allow an external force back in there. And I'm imagining if there's an external force, it's now a very small one that you turned on to probe the response of the system. All right, and whatever this is, it doesn't involve this function which characterizes the departure from equilibrium. So the result is just something you can work out. And I'll just call it some source function. So what comes out of this is just some linear equation. S equals minus C phi. So pretty easy to solve. Phi equals the inverse of the linearized collision operator on S. Oh, why don't you have the derivative acting on phi? The terms, so the only place I get derivatives acting on phi is when the left-hand side acts on this stuff. And by assumption, all space-time variation is slow. So terms which involve phi but don't involve space-time derivatives are first order in small quantities. Terms that involve phi and a space-time derivative. We're doing a linearization. We had to have a linear equation come out of it. This is it. Of course, our linearized collision operator is some pretty nasty <coughs> linear integral operator. Inverting it may not be the easiest thing, but that's a detail. Do we always know that this is not equal? Well, I could give a technical answer, but let me emphasize a physical answer. Right? If you're asking a sensible question, this has to give a sensible answer. So, But there is a question about uniqueness, right? Well, so as a linear operator, yeah. in fact, it is not invertible. There are zero modes. But you know you can have perfectly nice solutions to linear equations, even when your operator is not invertible, as long as the source is orthogonal to the zero modes. Now there is a question of non-uniqueness. I wasn't really going to go into that. That's directly tied up to saying, when you're describing small departures from equilibrium, what do you take as your reference state? So I could make an infinitesimal change in the parameters of my reference state and describe exactly the same physics. Your freedom to make that infinitesimal change is precisely the zero modes of the linearized collision operator. Yeah. Right, so this is where issues of do you like Eckhart frame? Do you like Landau Lipschitz frame? Come in. But that's a detail. OK. Um, we still haven't gotten to anything specific. This is the, the preview. <coughs> right? But if I have a linearized departure from equilibrium, I can plug it into my formulas for stress energy tensor or the, the uh, current J. Obviously, the first term is going to give me a local equilibrium term. And then knowledge of this departure from equilibrium will let me calculate a correction to it. And there it is. And I could write a similar thing for J. So 
let me not do all cases. Suppose I chose, I mean, I can now you know, use this framework to describe a whole bunch of different problems. Let me just pick one. Let me choose a spatially dependent velocity field so that it actually has a non-zero shear. Let me suppose it describes incompressible flow. with shear. Yes? So, why don't you keep terms in the steam in you, which is like, uh, which involves slow variation in the betas? Because if you have the V and you have the equilibrium, but uh, first order uh, variant of beta, variant of U, variant of U terms like those, why aren't those on the contract? Let me, let me urge you to just think of this at a high level. Right? We're simply describing the state of our system doing linearized perturbation theory. Right? There was the zeroth order term, and we just calculated the first order term. So any physical quantity you ask about, you should now have the zeroth order contribution plus the small first order correction. But and that's all. But your not has the, the spatial variation in it. Yes. So that first order oh, depends on x. Correct. And all of these depend on x dependence everywhere. OK, so let me just apply this to a case where I put spatial variation in the four velocity field. I am free to say that there's no variations in inverse temperature or chemical potential and no external force. So saying I have incompressible um, I don't write this thing. All right, saying I have a shear in the flow says that if I take the gradient of the spatial vector field, that this thing has a traceless symmetric piece. That's called the shear tensor. Or equivalently, I can just write it out explicitly by taking specifically the symmetric part of it, there it is, and subtracting a trace term. All right, so by saying I have shear in the flow, I'm saying this is non-zero. By saying it's incompressible, I'm actually saying the divergence vanishes. I'm free to say let the curl of the flow vanish so there's no rotation in the flow. If that's true, then this is something that's going to appear in the source term on the left-hand side of the Boltzmann equation. Solving this linear equation is going to produce a response. That response has to be linear in the shear because that's what's driving this departure from equilibrium. So I might as well write that departure from equilibrium as precisely this shear in the flow multiplied by some function on phase space, which then really has the dynamical information. So this is essentially just factoring out what amounts to the amplitude of the shear of the flow. You can now take that form. You can stuff it in here for the stress energy tensor. You can specifically look at the spatial part of it, Tij. You'll find a piece which looks just like the pressure of an equilibrium fluid whose spatial part is just diagonal, proportional to the identity matrix multiplied by the pressure. But this term will give you a correction. You'll get a correction which is proportional to the shear and the flow times something. And by definition, we call that something up to a sign. Change in equilibrium, we call that the shear viscosity. Is it related to the bottom formula? No. So, I could have asked a different question, which is, what's the response if I put in a flow field which has a divergence? 
then I get a different response and that coefficient we call the bulk viscosity. Sorry, elementary question. The, the, the C operator uh, does not oh does not contain derivatives. Correct. But S it's, has derivatives of U. But then we decided that oh I see. Yeah, okay. The <laughs> derivatives of U are hiding here in the source yeah. term. Right? So I'm getting a, a, a response that's just linear in, in that driving term. OK, so what I just called eta. All right, but you put together what I've said, and you now get a recipe for calculating the shear viscosity. Right? You calculate the particular source term that this form of gradients of the velocity give you. You go solve this linearized integral equation. You take this departure from equilibrium. You stick it back in there. And you read off the coefficient. It turns out I can write that in sort of a cute way. Uh, up to some number here. And for absolutely no good reason, I have it normalized this way. So this correction to the stress tensor that's linear in phi, all I'm saying is I write phi as this shear tensor times something else. I can just rewrite this integral. I can pull out that shear tensor, write everything that's left over. Everything that's left over will be some integral over momentum space of Whoops, that phi was now supposed to be a chi of this sort of um, rescaled departure from equilibrium times stuff I get from the source term. And I've just chosen to write this in a slightly more abstract notation where I've just introduced an inner product that's nothing but what I had up there a moment ago. And I did it just so I could say, if you actually put things together, you find well, you find that what you're really doing is calculating a diagonal matrix element of this linearized of the inverse of this linearized collision operator. What's your i? Then? So the i is, is whatever you get by evaluating this source term and then factoring out okay. this okay. shear of the flow. So just think of it as explicitly known simple stuff. So your i is basically that negative c inverse s, is it? No, no. i is the simple stuff. It's literally just s, but now s with the shear factored out just the same way I did for phi. Maybe I should just write that here. So S is I, I, J times that shear tensor. If you prefer, what are we doing here? The linearized collision operator acts on functions which you could decompose in angular momentum. All we're really doing here is taking a matrix element in what amounts to a, the L equals 2 subspace of that inverse collision operator. All right, I want to mention one thing just because I think it's sort of cute. So you can look at any number of books which talk about kinetic theory. They basically just recap what I do. If you look at historic books, then they get a point saying, this is hard. We don't really know how to invert this linear operator. So we're going to cheat. We're going to evaluate a first couple of moments. We'll demand that a few moments of this linear equation are satisfied. <laughs> this is all stuff that was done before there were decent computers. There's no excuse for not properly solving a linear equation anymore. You might as well do it. But it's nice to observe that this has a beautiful variational formulation. So 
I will just assert that if I define some simple quadratic form, a short exercise, which only now involves the collision operator itself, not its inverse, simply minimize that quadratic form and you get the right answer. And this is actually really nice if you're really doing calculations. So now you just do choose some decent basis set, you really turn that into just a finite dimensional matrix and you, you do so it. So what is the dimensional matrix? No, no. So this is, go back up to here. So we're acting on a vector space, which is arbitrary functions of spatial momentum, except they're really rank two tensors that are functions. Of, so that's, that's our infinite dimensional vector space. And that's what we're supposed to be doing this in. So in practice, you choose a finite basis, which approximates it. You do a sequence that gets bigger and bigger and you make sure you do a good job. Uh, are so, you basically summing over i and j? Yes. And i and j before we do the spatial pieces? Yes. So I just have this, the nature of this c operator that we're supposed to infer. So c does not contain derivatives. Correct. So it's, it's all, it acts ultra-locally on its argument. Only, it only knows about the momentum space dependence. So that's what you're adjusting here. You're saying in this departure from equilibrium, you know, how does that depend on momentum? Where is your density of quasi-particles? For what momentum are they bigger? For what momentum are they smaller in this particular non-equilibrium state that you're solving for? So the spatial, oh I see, so that's why your integral is only over momentum there? Yes. But in momentum space it's kind of a non-trivial operator? In the momentum space it's non-trivial and, uh, and, non and non-local because that's intrinsic in I collision, okay. right? That's okay. the structure of the collision term. Um, when am I supposed to stop? You started yeah, you like started 15 late. minutes late. Yeah, so. So Okay, um, all right, so I won't make more digressions about problems where you can localize it in momentum space. I finally get to an actual application. This is all still general. Any system that has a good quasi-particle description, that's the only thing I really wanted to focus on initially, I now want to choose. A very concrete application, I want to pick a theory. I want it to be what is in some sense the simplest microscopic theory that has a good quasi-particle description that describes on very long distance and long time something that you can think of as a neutral fluid that will have a nice hydrodynamic description. I want it to be a theory where I have some chance of doing calculations and I claim that a nice answer to this criteria may not be what first occurs to you. I want to claim that the nicest theory that, that illustrates everything I've talked about is hot QCD. Take honest to God quantum chromodynamics, describes quarks and gluons, describes all the physics of their binding into hadrons, <coughs> but think about this theory at very high temperatures. In quantum chromodynamics, at low temperature, it describes bound states, things we call hadrons. At high temperature, those bound states essentially dissolve or evaporate, and you have something you could and should think of as a plasma of quarks and gluons. There's some characteristic temperature where you go from one description to the other. That's essentially what's also called the scale lambda QCD. If you want to put a number on it, it's about 160 MeV, which you're free to convert into Kelvin if it makes you feel better about it. <laughs> but you might as well just think of it as a high temperature, 160 MeV. What's the temperature in this room? 25 MeV, little MeV. 140th of an electron volt. Right, everybody should remember that. Okay, so I want to assume 
not responsible for <laughs> that my temperature is large compared to this decompiment temperature. OK, so at these temperatures, you can, as I just said, think of the equilibrium state as a plasma of quarks and gluons. What's important is a QCD, the strength of interactions is characterized by some interaction strength. Think of it as being analogous to the fine structure constant in electromagnetism. It's a dimensionless measure of the strength of interactions. But really, it depends on the energy scale that you're interested in. So if we're doing high temperature physics, what's relevant is the strength of interactions at a temperature that is very high by assumption. And the key thing is that interaction strength decreases as the temperature increases. A property known as asymptotic freedom. For which a few people got a Nobel Prize. OK, so, so the whole point of looking at very hot QCD is to say that for sufficiently high temperature, quarks and gluons are weakly interacting. So I have a weakly interacting or weakly coupled plasma. And going back to my Initial remarks, that's the same thing as saying I have good quasi-particles. Quarks and gluons are good quasi-particles. All right, this is a highly relativistic plasma. Some of you may not sort of naturally think of that as a good thing that makes the treatment simpler, but it really does. It means I don't have to distinguish energy scales from momentum scales. It means I don't have to worry about the velocity of excitations being different for ones that have small momentum or high momentum. Effectively, all my excitations are moving nearly at the speed of light. The energy is nearly the same as the magnitude of the momentum up to a factor of c. That's the same thing as saying it's ultra-relativistic. Typical, so if I look at this system in equilibrium, typical excitations have an energy or a momentum which is comparable to the temperature. All right? That's just because the equilibrium Bose or Fermi distribution function dies exponentially with a characteristic scale, which is precisely the temperature. So loosely speaking, you should think of those distribution functions as simply <coughs> cutting off at energy or momentum comparable to the temperature. It's also important here that the the relevant quarks have masses which are less than lambda. You need that also for this to be. So for, for what I just said to be true, yes. Now, of course, if you really want to treat temperatures where one of the flavors of quarks has a mass comparable to the temperature, you're free to do so. But to make things simple, yes, I will assume that some flavors of quarks have masses which are small compared to the temperature, and I will just neglect them. Of course, other flavors of quarks may have masses which are large compared to the temperature, 
in which case you don't neglect the mass of the quark, you neglect the quark altogether. Right? They, they have negligible population, you might as well just forget about them and remove them from the theorem. All right, and let me note that the number density, right? How many quarks or gluons are present per unit volume? Well, there's only one scale that's relevant. That's basically what I've done by putting myself in this asymptotic regime. That simplifies things. So for these equilibrium questions, that number density just grows like t cubed. Notice that has the right dimensions. Number of particles per unit volume is the same as a cube of a temperature. All right, of course, that means the energy density is just the product of these, goes like t to the fourth. That's only for quark, right? For gluons, uh Equally true. Because the number, because the total number of gluons are not necessarily conserved. That's absolutely okay. true. So, uh, okay. I mean, but this just comes from, so this is just saying look at that Bose distribution <coughs> function. High temperature means the quantum statistics correction is pretty irrelevant. It's just like Boltzmann statistics. And, um, Oh, perhaps I should say this. So because gluons, you know, can come and go, they're not conserved, that means they necessarily never have any chemical potential. They're just a chemical potential equals zero. I didn't talk about chemical potentials of the quarks either. For simplicity, assume their chemical potentials are zero. That means you have the same number of quarks and antiquarks. But in all cases, their number density scale like T cubed. I'm ignoring factors of threes and eights and pi's. All of that stuff. But this is all because it's high temperature, so. Yes. So this is part of the simplicity of being in this ultra-relativistic regime. OK. So that's the end of the introduction. So. So we now have a specific theory. Now, I should have commented at some point, we know that if I want to calculate shear viscosity, there's a Kubo formula for it. I could talk about extracting that shear viscosity as some limit as frequency goes to zero of some TXY, TXY, correlator at exactly zero spatial momentum. I could have started talking about that without ever talking about kinetic theory. <coughs> I could say I've now got a specific microscopic theory. I could start doing perturbation theory. I could write lots and lots of Feynman diagrams and say, what's the big problem? Let's go calculate this. That approach is horrible. Truly dreadful. And it's easy to understand why. Let's just do one more bit of qualitative really physics. Awful, even, when you're in this regime. even in this regime. So even if g squared t is negligible, as small as you want, evaluating this limit of this correlator from Feynman diagrams is really nasty. And why is that? It comes back to just thinking a little bit about what shear viscosity tells you. Shear viscosity tells you something about how fluctuations in momentum relax. Or to just say it differently, it tells you about how momentum is transported in the system you're looking at. So the more efficient it is to transport an excess of momentum density from one region to another region, <coughs> the larger the shear viscosity is. So in other words, the longer the mean free path is, the larger the shear viscosity is. And you can go back and do a little dimensional analysis. And shear viscosity, roughly speaking, up to dimensionless factors, 
behaves like energy density times mean free path. But a mean free path inversely depends on scattering rates or scattering cross sections. Right? That mean free path right, um, is the inverse of some density of scatterers times a cross section times the velocity, which is 1. So in this ultra-relativistic region where quasi-particles are weakly interacting, that means if I think about some Feynman diagram, all you have to know is that every vertex gives you a factor of g. So a diagram that characterizes some scattering amplitude will have a factor of g squared. You square that to get a rate. And that'll be like g to the fourth. And that's what cross sections depend on. So a mean free path, you'd expect to behave like 1 over g to the fourth. And the point is, that's what you expect the viscosity to behave like. So in particular, it'll end up being some pure number, tq over g to the fourth, where that really is g to the fourth at the relevant scale. This isn't quite right. There's logarithmic corrections, which I was hoping to say something about. But it's good enough to illustrate the fact that this can't possibly come out of some simple evaluation of a couple of Feynman diagrams. How do you get g squared in the denominator? Right? You can only get there because, in fact, some complicated infinite class of diagrams must ultimately contribute. So you can analyze it that way. Because physically, viscosity is proportional to mean free paths, and mean free paths are inversely dependent on scattering rate. So as your quasi-particles get more and more weakly interacting, the fluid that they're ultimately describing has larger and larger viscosity. Now, of course, a hydrodynamic description of that fluid is only valid on length scales that are getting longer and longer because your mean free path is growing. But this resummation of diagrams that would give you the denominator, wouldn't it be also a justification, but diagrammatic Sure. There, well, there are ways of doing this that will do just what you said. Now, in practice, you have to decide what degree of masochism you wish to embrace. So, yes, you can do elegant, formal derivations of effective kinetic theory using things similar to the projection operator techniques that were introduced. Equally well, you can build it bottom up. You can simply say, if I understand that my theory has quasi-particles, if I'm able to use the microscopic theory to calculate scattering processes of those quasi-particles, let me simply build by hand a kinetic theory that reproduces the right physics. I claim that that's an equally fine justification. Mm -hmm. Right. Even in this context of hot QCD, what I did with my collaborators was bottom up. Sang Yang Zhen in McGill assigned a graduate student the task of reproducing our calculation of shear viscosity really by identifying the diagrams that contribute. And he did. I would never have given this to a graduate student. It's a horrible. It took him a year, two years, but, but he did. So does your argument imply that uh, going from microscopic theory to kinetic theory, you really need non-perturbative physics, even if the coupling is very, very small? Whoa. So. Because I would naively think if the. Uh, I would not. I would not describe this as needing non-perturbative physics. Right? The physics of the scattering of my quasi-particles is something I can understand with weak coupling methods. It, the problem is you're asking a question. It's all in the question. It's not in the physics. You're asking a question which, as I showed a moment ago, depends on matrix elements of the inverse of the linearized collision operator. So you have weak coupling. That means you can actually construct that linearized collision operator 
and make sure it reproduces the right physics. That's fine. And then you just have to go through the exercise of calculating the relevant, relevant entries of the inverse of that collision operator. That doesn't mean the physics is non-perturbative. It just means you asked a tricky question. What you said would also apply to conductivity or other... Absolutely. Absolutely. I just happened to choose shear viscosity in my example here. If I had more time, we're happy to talk about it with you. We could be doing diffusion constants. We could be doing electrical conductivity. It's all exactly the same. Is it possible to actually measure the viscosity of uh, uh, high energy parts and one so? Good question. So now this takes us into a more phenomenological question about where, you know, to what extent can one really produce such a system? And the short answer is either you're talking about very early universe physics or you're talking about the physics of heavy ion collisions. And in the latter context, to actually extract it from the data is not terribly clean, but you do a lot of work modeling what comes out of the heavy ion collisions. And I think there's very compelling arguments that you constrain the shear viscosity within a factor of two. And then we can quibble about exactly just how tight those constraints are. But I just made a jump there from something, a whole discussion which was really only valid in asymptotically high temperature heavy ion collision. And that was a big, not terribly well justified jump and I should say a little bit more about that tomorrow. OK, um, I've run out of time. I did want to say I had hoped to talk a little bit more about actually building the terms that go into that collision operator. Some of them are really simple, these sort of two to two scattering processes, although you do have to put thermal corrections on the internal lines. But it's interesting that even to get the viscosity at leading order in the coupling, so it behaves like one, one over g to the fourth, ignoring logarithms, you could imagine saying there's some number here plus corrections that are suppressed by powers of g. Just to get this number correct, turns out you need to do processes which are <coughs> considerably trickier which is where some quark or some gluon is running along and it just happens to radiate another gluon. And in a vacuum, this can't happen. This is like a massless particle just suddenly splitting into two. But in a thermal context, it can basically because you're constantly getting very soft scattering, very small momentum scattering. So you've got some quasi-particle running along. It happens to have a tiny little scattering that barely changes its energy or momentum, but that's still enough to give it a little wiggle. That means it was accelerated. That means it can radiate. The resulting angle between these two particles is very small. So this is a really near collinear process. It's interesting <coughs> quantum mechanics because, in fact, you have to coherently treat lots of soft scatterings. And in this effective theory, <coughs> Coming back to the question, and, and I'll stop here, you really can represent it by saying, oh, these soft scatterings hardly change the energy or momentum. So in my effective theory, let me just ignore them. In effect, this is a scattering process that takes one particle into two, or it can go backwards. So you actually put these near collinear collision terms into your effective description, and you need them there if you really want to get an answer which is correct to leading order. Okay, sorry to go on so long. I'll stop there. Can we, let's do questions.